These are the instructions for the Russia-Ukraine nuclear crisis simulation intended for the strategic studies course at Concordia University. The simulation has 18 positions. There are three that play roles of military commanders of Russia, four that play the different Siloviki factions. These are individual coalitions of Siloviki, in other words, FSB and other secret police, organized crime and racketeering organizations, select oligarchs, and party affiliations. There's Belarus, Ukraine, East Europe, which comprises Poland, Romania, and Slovakia, the Baltic states, which comprise Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, and Sweden and Finland, Orthodox NATO, which includes Greece and Bulgaria, but also Hungary, Germany and Italy, UK and France, US and Canada, Amnesty International, and other liberal agitation movements, and BRIC, which includes Brazil, South Africa, India, China, and Saudi Arabia. The sequence of play during the game is first there's a random task determination. There's a role to determine what positions the generals and the Siloviki factions will take on that particular turn. Under certain circumstances, these positions can be assigned non-randomly if someone other than Vladimir Putin is in charge of Russia. In this particular simulation, Vladimir Putin is not individually represented. Rather, policies are made by the Siloviki and by the military commanders. In the third step, the Siloviki factions can take their actions depending on what task they've been assigned. In the fourth phase, military factions may take actions depending on what tasks they've been assigned. In the fifth step, discontent is calculated. This includes attempts by state, states that are hostile to Russia to increase discontent within Russia, Belarus, and Kazakhstan. Attempts to suppress discontent by the uh, Russians and by Belarus. Attempts to amplify discontent by Amnesty International and actions taken on the battlefield or elsewhere that could cause the index to increase. In the sixth step, the Siloviki factions can become sanctioned by state players. In the seventh step, the impact of economic sanctions on Russian discontent is calculated. In the eighth step, the effects of cutting off oil pipelines and cutting off natural gas is estimated against the different countries. In the ninth step, Russian ground forces move and conduct combat on the map. In the tenth step, Ukrainian forces then move and conduct combat on the map. The initial step before playing the game is to establish the initial Siloviki influence. There are four Siloviki factions. Each of them controls 25% of the total pool of influence. During the game, that influence can be increased or decreased, but it never exceeds 100. Under some circumstances, influence can be permanently lost or reduced, particularly as discontent increases in Russia. Before the Siloviki begin playing, it's necessary to determine what profile the Siloviki have. In other words, what actions they took before the outbreak of the war. In the first step, each Siloviki faction is asked whether they accept bribes to and from the oligarchs. For every instance in which bribes are accepted, that faction receives one influence point from each of the other three factions, and it adds three influence points to itself. If a faction chooses not to bribe oligarchs, it does not receive that payoff. 
In the second instance, each faction is asked whether they bribe political parties. And again, the same mechanism. For every party that's a faction that says yes, they receive one influence point from each of the other three factions for a total of three points. The logic is that if all of the factions choose to bribe, then in the end there's no change in the relative influence. In the third step, each faction chooses whether they, lo they, they launder money abroad. If so, they each get one influence point from each of the other factions. However, when laundering money, there's an impact because these groups are more vulnerable to sanctions to those states that receive oligarch money like, for example, England in the UK-French player position. In the fourth step, each faction chooses whether they engage in racketeering of military logistics. Again, if they do, they get plus one influence point from each other Siloviki faction. If, however, they say yes, each of the factions that said yes has their value multiplied by minus 0 0.5 for, for each of the factions for a maximum total of minus two. That is a minus two on the die roll that impacts military performance. In the fifth step, each Siloviki faction chooses whether to engage in coup proofing the military, in effect playing a role in selecting loyal military leaders. And again, the mechanism is a plus one influence point from each of the other Siloviki factions resulting in a maximum of a minus two. So a full movement towards racketeering and coup proofing by four of the factions will lead to a net minus four, which is a huge degra degradation of the effectiveness of the military. Also setting up, at initially, the Russians receive 12 divisions and they receive two brigades. The two brigades are deployed in Donetsk and Luhansk and the 12 divisions are deployed anywhere in Russia, Crimea, and with the permission of the Belarusian player in Belarus. The Belarus player deploys one division in Belarus, and then the Ukrainian player deploys 10 divisions in Ukraine. All NATO pieces are held off the map to start with. So, the Siloviki factions are lettered A, B, C, and D. And at the game end, the point value that the Siliviki have accumulated indicates the ranking from best to worst of the four players of the Siliviki. Now, notionally, they're associated with the four political parties. A is United Russia Party, B is the Liberal Democratic Party of Russia, C is the Communist Party, and D is a Just Russia for Truth Party. And as mentioned before, each of the Siloviki is a coalition of a particular faction of uh, the Kremlin Tower of FSB intelligence, oligarchs, and political party members. The goal of each Siloviki faction is to increase its influence relative to the other Siloviki factions, and this typically can only be done by reducing the influence of the other factions. Each turn a Siloviki faction is assigned a random task where they will have an opportunity to serve Russia and to pursue their goal to get more influence. When a Siloviki faction is reduced to zero influence, it's removed from play and they join the Amnesty International player as a dissident. The four Siloviki factions each begin the game with 25 influence points, totaling 100. So it basically represents uh, uh, a percentage distribution of the points between each of the factions. So there are four tasks that the Siloviki can be tasked with. One, disciplining oligarchs. Two, domestic policing. Three, foreign intelligence. Four, joining Putin's entourage. And fifth, action in Ukraine. And you can see here a chart, you roll a 1d10 or a 10-sided die or use a random generator on a calculator, which is the first digit to the right of the decimal place. And this tells you uh, which of the factions A, B, C, or D is given which of the assignments. And you can see that there's also a random generator, 1 to 5, which applies to the military factions and the three jobs that they have, which will be elaborated later. The first Siloviki task is joining the Putin entourage and the 
Rossi Gardia. So proximity to Putin allows the targeted reduction of a single chosen adversary Siloviki faction by minus three influence, with a plus one redistributed to each of the other non-targeted factions, including the faction that's in the Putin entourage. Also, in the specific situation of a military coup, modifiers are doubled in the value for the Siloviki faction assigned to the Putin entourage task. And with regard to assassinating Putin, the Siloviki faction tasked with Putin's security, his entourage, may nominate an agreeing successor Siloviki faction instead of requiring the support of the three of the four Siloviki factions, which is an alternate method. These are elaborated later. The second task is disciplining oligarchs. Here, the Siloviki faction has the option to selectively reduce each other Siloviki faction by minus one influence and gaining plus one from each targeted faction. If the leading faction with the most influence points at the beginning of the turn uh, is disciplining the oligarchs, they can selectively inflict a minus two loss on uh, each of the factions and gain a plus two from each of the targeted factions for net plus six. The third task is domestic, domestic secret policing. By spending three of its own influence points that are redistributed to the other three Siloviki factions, the Siloviki, Siloviki faction may choose to reduce either the Russian discontent index or the Belarus discontent index or the Kazakhstan discontent index. The value is randomly reduced by 1d5, in other words, one to five points. The third task is foreign engagement. When involved in foreign engagements, the Siloviki faction may engage in each activity listed below once per turn. And there's a list of these activities. The first is that Siloviki faction may dispense 10 Russian foreign aid points total in the game to any country. Once these points are assigned, they cannot be reassigned. The dispensation of foreign aid must indicate the target state, the quantity, and any conditions on that aid. Exporting gas. Only the Siloviki faction tasked with foreign engagement can make changes to natural gas exports. Gas exports may be cut by the recipient state as well, and pipelines may be cut uh, where the pipeline transits a country. So this is the initial distribution of gas exports. A number is indicated, which is the quantity of gas that is exported from Russia to the target state. And also is indicated are the pipelines that are used that bring the gas from Russia to the target state. So you can see Germany and Italy are heavily dependent at 40, Ukraine at 10, Eastern Europe at 10, UK, France at 10, Orthodox NATO at five, Belarus 10, Turkey at five, Baltic states at 10. The BRIC do not absorb natural gas, but they can and there are consequences outlined in each of the player cards for the consequences of not receiving the natural gas because it's been cut off or because the pipeline has been blocked and Russia also receives a penalty for failing to sell its natural gas. Gas is moved from Russia to its target states through a series of pipelines. Now there are three pipelines uh, one which goes directly to Germany through the Baltic, one which goes through Belarus and then to Eastern Europe, and then one which goes through uh, Ukraine to the rest of Europe. And you can see here the Baltic Sea uh, essentially fuels natural gas exports to Germany and Italy with a capacity of 10. The pipeline that goes from Belarus to Poland has a capacity of 40, and Ukraine's pipeline has a capacity of 20. For the purposes of the simulation, a simple graphic is put up on the blackboard so that players can intervene using multicolored markers on the blackboard or chalk to indicate where pipelines have been cut uh, or where gas has been reduced either by the recipients uh, or by the exporters. This is a map representing the first simulation of this game and the consequence of the Ukrainians uh, cutting the pipeline that goes through Ukraine, despite the costs to themselves. An additional activity is cyber warfare disinformation. 
by expending three of its own influence points that are redistributed to the other three Siloviki factions, the Siloviki faction may choose to reduce the World Outrage Index by 1d5. The World Outrage Index is very important because as it goes higher, it permits NATO to intervene into the Ukraine. And the final task for the Siloviki assigned foreign engagement is negotiations with Ukraine, which simulates the Foreign Minister Lavrov. This is the only point of contact that is permitted negotiating directly with the other states, including Ukraine, Belarus, and NATO. However, any state able to sanction Siloviki may speak to a Siloviki faction with the intent of influencing them. So, foreign states can sanction specific Siloviki factions in order to play the factions off against each other. The fifth Siloviki task is Ukraine operations. Here, the Siloviki may engage in each activity listed below once per turn. First, they may engage in looting. The Siloviki faction may increase its influence by plus three at the expense of a minus one decrease to the other three factions, resulting in a one point increase in the World Outrage Index. Also, there's an unfavorable minus one to the first combat conducted in Ukraine by the Russians for that next turn. Anti-Nazi deportation operations. This provides a plus one bonus attacker modifier to combat uh, for combat for Russian forces, but it increases the World Outrage Index by one point. Chemical weapons use. This provides a plus five bonus attacker modifier to combat for Russian forces and increases World Outrage Index by five points. So what's important to note is that it's the Siloviki that choose to use chemical weapons, not the military, even though the military conduct operations. This is a simple graphic that you would put on a blackboard so the students can track the number of influence points held by each of the Siloviki factions. This is the one actually used in my simulation and you can see at the very top the list of sanctions in which a, a state has specifically targeted one faction or another. You can see within the box the first faction has become dissident and you can see the profile pre-game that were adopted by the other factions. So you can see Siloviki Faction B has chosen to launder money and to bribe party officials. You can also see in the bottom left, uh, uh, bottom right, the combat effect of minus one, which is the net of corruption and coup proofing uh, by all the Siloviki factions. And in this case, it was a mild uh, minus one to combat. There are also three military factions, A, B, and C. Every turn, the military factions are randomly assigned a military tasking, which are determined by a chart. And it's between rocket force commander, military policing, or Ukraine battlefield commander. The Russian military factions largely represent the interests of the Russian state and operate across purposes with the Siloviki factions, who are basically trying to maximize their wealth in the state. There are a series of victory points, but essentially it's for capturing cities in Ukraine, more points for the larger cities, for capturing Ukraine on the eastern side of the Dnieper River and on the western side. And you can see other state level interests like securing the cultural rights of the Russian community uh, in the Baltic states. Uh, you can also see a lot of negatives. So uh, the cost of uh, Russia being a target of a theater nuclear attack. Uh, there's um, negatives for losing the Donetsk and Luhansk. Uh, there's a victory point penalty for uh, all of the Siloviki factions that engaged in money laundering because of massive capital flight. Uh, compensations uh, in energy from the BRIC if Russia is able to sell its energy uh, to those states. A loss of points to Russia. Um, uh, if it doesn't sell natural gas to its customers, if uh, Ukraine joins uh, NATO or the European Union, if Nagorno-Karabakh is returned to Azerbaijan, and this is because of relations with Turkey, if Russia concedes influence in Syria to Turkey, um, if Turkey closes the Straits of Marmara and violates the Montreux Convention, um, uh, if uh, Finland joins NATO, uh, if ever the uh, Kazakh or Belarus discontent indexes reach uh, 100, uh, or if Russia gives up Crimea to the Ukraine. And you can see policy instruments. These are policy choices that the leaders may make um, to deal um, uh, with the foreign countries. So here you can see at the bottom the randomization of the tasks for the military factions. 
So the three taskings for the military are first, rocket forces commander. The missile force commander makes the decision to employ tactical and theater nuclear weapons and launch conventional weapons. Conventional missile attacks uh, can be conducted uh, uh, whenever the uh, Russian rocket commander wishes, as well as use of tactical nuclear weapons. There's no restraint uh, except for the impact on um, retaliation. Uh, theater weapons, however, depend on NATO entering inside Ukraine. So Rus Russia may launch a single rocket volley each turn in East Europe. This increases the victory point cost of NATO assistance and NATO intervention by one victory point. But it also increases the World Outrage Index by two points. It also eliminates the requirement for NATO consensus. So no longer uh, for uh, level three NATO intervention uh, do you require unanimity because it's assumed that the articles necessary for NATO mobilization are enacted by the rocket attack. Russia may also launch a maximum of one missile strike per Ukrainian city and uh, one strike per turn. Each instance inflicts a minus one victory point on Ukraine and a plus one world outrage, but reduces the target city's defense by a one value bombardment. The second task is military policing. The military policing commander may reduce the discontent indexes by 1d5 um, uh, in a chosen state, uh, all three in a turn if requirements are met. If they have one of the divisions deployed there in Belarus, uh, um, Russia, or Kazakhstan. Once this is done, it leads to provocations and it unlocks and permits Amnesty International to begin their agitation campaign in the country against Russia, Belarus, or Kazakhstan, where military policing was conducted. So just to give a bit of a background on this, although you will see the chart shortly, the discontent index is very important because it determines the stability of the Russian, Belarus, and Kazakhstan governments. Initially, it's increased by losses that occur inside uh, Ukraine, um, and it's increased by uh, uh, economic sanctions, but generally it proceeds very slowly. Uh, however, if the military, not the Siloviki policing, but if the military get involved in military policing, it's very provocative. It then unlocks Amnesty International, which is able to significantly uh, uh, increase discontent. So it is very tempting for the military to get involved and to assist the police in suppressing uh, demonstrations and, and uh, uh, political uh, demonstrations, but in so doing, it unlocks uh, an acceleration process. So it's one of the difficult choices that the Russian military has to make. Number three, battlefield commander in Ukraine. This is the third task. This commander is responsible for deploying, moving, and conducting combat with the Russian army on the war game map of Ukraine and its environs. The Russian army consists of 12 divisions of soldiers on any turn in which an entire Ukrainian city is not captured or a Ukrainian or Belarus city is lost, the Ukrainian battlefield commander may suffer an arrest result if the Putin entourage task a Siloviki faction or the ruling Siloviki faction decides to do so. The effect of an arrest on a military faction is that the other military factions with a lower accumulation of arrests may switch military taskings voluntarily. So the Ukraine battlefield commander before the game begins will set up those 12 divisions and they can deploy up to one uh, in uh, Belarus, Russia, and, and Kazakhstan in order to enable the military to do pol uh, military policing there. Under some circumstances, uh, once Belarus and Kazakhstan reach a certain threshold of discontent, two army divisions are required to deploy there to keep the country from collapsing. So in order to conduct the uh, ground combat, we first ran a simulation at Concordia University. This is in the uh, Professor Michael Breacher seminar room. We took the uh, Barbarossa map, which was about eight hexes, uh, eight kilometers to the hex, and we ran a battalion level simulation using forces uh, that Russia is known to have de uh, deployed using a database that was created um, on command and for the Ukrainian forces, we recreated the non-national guard forces at the battalion level using Wikipedia. And by looking specifically at the type of weapon systems, T-80s, uh, BMPCs, uh, BTR-80s, the type of artillery, 2S1s, 2S3s, 2S7s, uh, in order to determine the precise strength and the speed of that unit. And we took particular care uh, looking at the logistics. The first time we ran the simulation, uh, the 
Uh, logistics were not appreciated, although we did to some level anticipate the lack of combined arms operations. So here you can see a map of uh, Ukraine. We used uh, Gulf Strike rules, uh, rescaled, um, in a, because of the uh, 8 kilometers rather than the 25 kilometers to the hex. And uh, we were operating uh, 24 hours to the turn instead of 2 days to the turn. This is a close-up of the battalion level operations um, occurring around uh, Kharkiv. The geography is uh, modified. The urban areas extend one hex out and there are three levels and so those cities uh, have a, a terrain effects that are um, significantly greater than what you see uh, on this map. Here you can see operations uh, north of Kyiv um, as the Russians uh, cross over the Belarusian border on their way to the city. And a key element here is about half the pieces are logistics pieces carrying supplies uh, within a very congested road network and we found that to realistically capture the um, uh, time space uh, considerations so we can more accurately represent the combat. And we did this uh, here in a second rerunning of the war. In a previous um, uh, weekend we ran the simulation um, using brigade level units which created a very different effect. Um, for this we had the support of the uh, Concordia University Simulation and Diplomatic Society which provided funding and lunch for the 10 students that showed up for the three separate weekends to uh, design and run the simulation. Uh, we also ran uh, Frank Chadwick's assault series to get a tactical sense of how the Russians are different from the Soviets, particularly in their neglect of combined arms, uh, where the Soviets would use artillery for suppression to enable uh, rapid movement and would use infantry to suppress enemy anti-tank abilities to facilitate the movement of armor quickly down the roads and to exploit uh, large-scale high-tempo operations at the battalion level uh, and uh, we estimated correctly that the Russians were no longer able to do this which produced a very different type of war because uh, whereas Russian artillery is very powerful um, for suppression it's not very powerful uh, in bombardment and Russian tanks advancing against American for example armor uh, without the benefit of suppressing artillery and smoke and infantry suppressing anti-tank weapons are extremely vulnerable. So this is the map that was ultimately produced by one of my uh, students, Attila Arslaner. Each hex is 21 kilometers across. Um, we allowed um, the students to subjectively interpret the map. So where there are towns on the map and roads the students were allowed to argue between each other precisely what the meaning was of the map. And this is important because people need to know how to do map appreciations. So what we went with was a divisional level simulation that significantly simplified but was based on the time-space considerations of the uh, uh, previous simulations that we showed you. So you can see the pieces that we used, which is not a lot. Uh, there are uh, 10 pieces that are green for the Ukrainians representing divisions. There are 12 Russian divisions. Then there's a variety of NATO divisions, a single Belarus division, and then two brigades in Luhansk and the Donetsk. Now ground combat is very simple uh, and ground movement. First pieces move and then they attack. Uh, each piece has a movement of a uh, factor of four. If a piece moves on a road, uh, it costs uh, one point, so it can move four hexes in a turn, which is approximately 80 kilometers. Um, and the scale uh, for the game is uh, two days uh, per turn. So uh, it's you know, fairly representative. Units may not stack, they may not be put on top of each other, and they may not pass through each other. Um, if uh, the unit is moving off-road, meaning it's going from hex to hex, um, and uh, uh, there's no road, then it takes the entire four movement points to move a single hex. Units may not move across the Dnieper River unless there's a, a bridge that allows them to cross. Now combat's resolved uh, between individual attackers and defenders. There's, units do not group together. Um, when a unit attacks, 
uh, you take its attack value, whatever the number is, it could be say 10, and you subtract from it the defender's value, which could be say 5 in the case of the Ukrainian, so that would leave a 5. And then there are terrain modifiers, a minus 5 for a city, a minus 1 for a town. Um, if a hex has got one third or less green, it's a forest, it would be a minus 1. If it's got two thirds or more a forest, it's a minus two. Rather, a, a, a forest it is one third to two thirds. It's a minus one, and a, a attacking across a river to bridge is a minus two. So uh, you can you can see that cities provide a lot of security, and it's not just the city, but uh, any hex which contains the white circle that indicates the city. Plus, uh, for every hex rounded up that a Russian or Belarusian unit is from its distant from its border along a road, or not along a road. Uh, it suffers a minus 0 0.5. So the farther Russians get from the front, from their frontier, uh, the more they're debilitated. Once they capture a city in Ukraine, that then becomes their new supply hub. So Russian units essentially have to gang up in order to attack cities. Um, but if the Siloviki have significantly degraded the Russian units because of coup proofing and racketeering of their logistics, Russian units will be severely um, abnormally affected. You can see here that value under the special attacker modifiers. Now there is a special uh, type of combat um, uh, which is bombardment. Here a unit will not attack, it'll simply stay in place and instead in its turn it'll place a bombardment marker. And for every bombardment marker it puts on a city it eliminates one of the uh, defensive um, negatives for the city. So five bombardment on a city will completely eliminate that city as a defensive position. However each bombardment increases the world outrage value by one. Now the defender, the Ukrainians, have special modifiers depending on the level of assistance and the level of NATO intervention. And these all depend on the world outrage index and these have to be paid for uh, by one of uh, three players, either the uh, UK um, French player or the American Canadian player or by the German Italian player and those will be detailed later. But you can see the uh, progressive increase in the World Outrage Index and the modifier to the Ukrainian forces both in the defense and the attack depending on how much um, is invested by the, by the sponsor of the level of assistance or the level of intervention. Now, NATO military assistance to Ukraine, which was just mentioned, requires uh, transiting either Eastern Europe or Orthodox NATO. So one of the two have to uh, provide basing permission. Uh, for it to function, one of three countries have to pay for it. And uh, again, that's the chart that will uh, be later on. But level one assistance basically represents intelligence, drones, munitions, anti-tank missiles. It gives a plus one modifier to the Ukrainian forces. It, it's something that can be done immediately at the start of the game. It does not require any world outrage index. Level two assistance uh, includes armored vehicles, artillery, air defense systems, and training. This provides a plus two modifier for the Ukrainians and it requires a world outrage index of 10. And Romania and Poland's military forces may intervene in the Ukraine. Uh, Romania has an incentive not to allow Odessa to fall to the Russians. However, the moment any NATO force deploys within Ukraine, Russia is permitted to engage in theater nuclear attacks against countries uh, in Europe. In this game, there is no strategic exchange between the, so between the Russians and the Americans. It's assumed um, you can have tactical nuclear warfare and you can have theater nuclear warfare, but it won't escalate beyond that. Level 3 assistance assumes combat aircraft, um, and this is a plus 2 defender and a plus 1 attacker modifier for Ukrainian forces. It uh, requires um, uh, the support of Eastern Europe as, as per normal. So military, NATO military intervention um, and rather, it requires support of U.S., Canada, Germany, Italy, and Eastern Europe because they're providing the air bases. So NATO military intervention to Ukraine, level one NATO intervention. This essentially means a NATO uh, no-fly zone. It's plus three defender, plus one attacker modifier. Um, it requires support of all of those countries. And at this point, U.S., U.K., French, and German, Italian forces may intervene in the Ukraine. Level two NATO intervention. It's a plus three uh, defender and plus two attacker modifier for Ukrainians. Uh, Polish forces may enter Belarus at this point. So Belarus may be put under threat. Level 3 NATO intervention. Uh, this requires NATO policy consensus and it allows NATO forces to enter Belarus as well and to uh, knock that government out of power. Uh, however, if 
uh, Russia has ever fired a rocket at a NATO member or Eastern Europe, then NATO policy consensus is no longer required. So the Orthodox NATO members who are reluctant to see uh, Russia severely damaged, or Turkey, um, they can no longer veto uh, level 3 NATO intervention. So theater nuclear weapons. Russia may detonate a theater nuclear weapon against a counter value target once NATO has deployed land forces inside Ukraine. Russia must select the target, either Eastern Europe, Baltic States, Germany, Italy, UK, France, Turkey, or Orthodox NATO. Now a state may immediately retaliate against the nuclear strike by doubling the number of theater weapons detonated against it on its target. So if Russia detonated four nuclear weapons against NATO targets, US, Canada, or UK, France may conduct nuclear attack with eight detonations. If US, Canada, and the UK, France refuse to retaliate with any nuclear weapons, then Germany, Italy, and Turkey, if they were the target of nuclear weapons detonations, may seize US nuclear weapons, but may only retaliate proportionally, meaning they may only launch a number of warheads equal to the number received within the prior turn. This weapon seizure may only occur once, after which the US has removed any remaining nuclear weapons. Uh, two issues that will come up a lot in the game mechanics are economic sanctions and foreign aid. Any state may initiate economic sanctions with a state with which it trades and must specify the precise value and points of the economic sanctions. These are all detailed on the player cards. This is record, recorded by, punish, by the punishing state issuing a ticket, which is a signed piece of paper recording the event, and given to the professor at the end of the simulation. Sanctions may be conditional. It may depend on whether a country has done a certain thing. That would be specified on the ticket. The sanctions index level is a measure of the level of economic sanctions for any given turn, and it has effects on the Russian and Belarus discontent index and the victory points of the various states. For the economic sanctions to have an effect on the Russian and Belarus discontent index, it must be announced during the game to the referee. For most of the sanctions, although a minus one victory point is inflicted on the target, a minus half is inflicted on the country doing the sanctioning. So sanctions are not free. They also damage your own economy, but to a lesser extent. States have foreign aid, uh, and it, there, for each of the player cards, there's an amount that's specified, and foreign aid may be given to designated states uh, for points, victory points. The player must sign and record the amount of foreign aid points and the target recipient state, and whether there are any conditions on the foreign aid. So, the discontent index for Russia, Belarus, and Kazakhstan. First, Russia. The Russian discontent index is a measure from 0 to 100, representing the level of discontent within the general Russian population. Actions that increase the Russian discontent index. Each instance of a repulsed Russian attack that fails to incur a retreat result on an opposing unit because it creates significant losses among Russian troops increases the uprising index by 1. Each turn, the sanctions index level increases the Russian discontent level by its same value. If any U.S. land units deploy inside Ukraine after a permanent ceasefire is arranged between Russia and Ukraine, the Russian discontent index increases by 20. For each of Belarus and Kazakhstan collapsing, uh, Russia's discontent index increases by 20. Uh, Russia's in uh, discontent index also increases the value determined by those states that provide a sanctuary for Russian dissidents. Russian discontent index military effects. When the Russian discontent index reaches 75, the military faction involved in military policing may intervene against the Siloviki faction. And when the Russian discontent index reaches 90, the military faction involved in military policing is empowered to intervene against a Siloviki faction that has gained, engaged in coup proofing itself against the military as an initial measure. Intervening against the Siloviki faction means redistributing six influence points from one faction and reassigning those six points to other Siloviki factions. At a Russian discontent index of 90, the military faction involved in military policing may join with the Siloviki faction and attempt a coup against Russian President Vladimir Putin. Military coup against Putin. The military faction must announce that it is attempting to conduct a coup against Putin or against the current regime leadership in conjunction with the Siloviki faction that is not in power ruling Russia. There are five steps to conducting a coup. One, the military faction must announce which Siloviki faction has volunteered to join its coup attempt. Two, two of the three general factions must agree on the coup. Now you'll notice that there is an exception to this if you go back to the Siloviki faction if it's in the Putin entourage. Number three, the base likelihood of the coup is 50% plus 10% per point committed by the faction seeking the coup and minus 10% per point committed by other factions. Modifiers are doubled in value if the Siloviki faction is assigned as Putin's entourage. All expended points go to the Siloviki faction that succeeds in the coup or are distributed to the Siloviki factions that oppose the coup if they succeed in resisting the coup. 
with remaining points being assigned to the factions in the order of A, B, C, and D. If the coup succeeds against Putin and against subsequent Siloviki factions, the winning Siloviki faction can assign Siloviki tasks non-randomly, so they can put their favorite factions in charge of certain positions. The Russian Discontent Index, Siloviki Effects. Every turn that the Russian Uprising Index reaches a given discontent level, each Siloviki faction permanently loses the specified influence points. So, at a discontent level of 20, each loses one influence point per turn, at 60, minus two per turn, and at 80, minus three per turn. Assassination of Vladimir Putin. When the Russian Discontent Index reaches 75, a Siloviki faction may attempt to assassinate Putin, for which there is a 10% probability. If the Siloviki faction fails in the assassination, or it succeeds in the assassination but did not get into power, it must give one influence point to each of the other factions and reduce its own level of influence by three points. If it succeeds, there is no influence point loss, but three of the four Siloviki factions must immediately declare a successor, or the military faction currently serving the military policing task will appoint a Siloviki faction, and not necessarily the one that conducted the assassination. The Siloviki faction tasked with Putin's security may nominate an agreeing successor Siloviki faction instead of requiring the support of the three or four factions. General Russian Uprising. If, in any given turn, the Russian Discontent Index reaches 100, each Siloviki faction suffers a permanent minus one influence loss per the following schedule to a maximum minus three. For every bribed oligarch, bribed political parties, or money laundering abroad. The factions remain, but the political parties achieve prominence over the Siloviki. The Siloviki faction with a dissident immediately gains 10 influence points from each of the Siloviki factions and becomes a Russian leader and allocates tasks non-randomly. If there is more than one dissident, then the leader is chosen in the order of A, B, C, D. The dissident, backed by the Amnesty International position, poaches an additional 5 influence points from each of the other Siloviki factions. Dissidents whose Siloviki factions bribe political parties or oligarchs as part of their original setup lose nine influence points for each infraction to the other Siloviki factions. Belarus Discontent Index The Belarus Discontent Index measures the level of discontent against the Lukashenko regime. It is increased by agitation by the Amnesty International position and by other agitation actions. When it reaches 25, the Belarus Army Division must return to Belarus. When it reaches 50, the government will collapse unless Russia permanently deploys two divisions into Belarus, off map. When it reaches 100, the Belarus, Belarus regime collapses. The Belarus discontent index can be reduced by the Siloviki faction tasked with domestic policing to the strength of 1d10. Each NATO unit that enters Belarus and is above and beyond the number of Russian and Belarus units deployed there increases the Belarus discontent index by 20. Kazakhstan discontent index. The Kazakhstan Discontent Index measures the level of discontent against the Kazakhstan regime. It is increased by the agitation of Amnesty International and by other agitation actions. When it reaches 50, the government will collapse unless Russia permanently deploys two divisions into Kazakhstan. When it reaches 100, the Kazakhstan regime collapses. The Kazakhstan Discontent Index can be reduced by the Siloviki faction tasked with domestic policing to the strength of 1d5. World Outcry Index. The World Outcry Index measures the Western world's reaction to Russian actions. Each instance of bombardment, looting, and denazification results in a plus one value to the index. Each military policing in Russia, Belarus, Kazakhstan results in a plus one world outcry. There's a minus one world outcry for each entirely captured Ukrainian city indicating a fag complete in Russia's sphere of influence. In other words, the faster Russia captures the individual cities, the faster NATO countries will submit to the new reality. So Ukraine is given a strong incentive not to let cities fall. So this is how I've put it on um, the blackboard. You, you want to put the different indexes there and you want to put some of the modifiers underneath. There's also a uh, box for cyber warfare for deployment of Russian versus NATO forces in the Baltic and for any assistance uh, provided um, uh, to uh, between different countries in the form of foreign aid. This is how it was represented during the first running of the simulation with my class. You can see that Russian discontent shot up to 90, Belarus at 60, uh, Kazakhstan was not targeted, 
and world outrage uh, was at 54. You'll see that uh, Russian missile attacks and chemical weapons also increased world outrage. So let's go now through the individual player cards for the non-Russian player. There's of course the uh, Belarus player. Uh, they set up their Belarus division. You can see they get points for foreign aid and if uh, Western Ukraine is captured by Russia. And there are large numbers of negatives. Essentially, Belarus prefers if Russia is not deployed inside Belarus and if uh, Belarus's forces are not deployed fighting the Ukraine. Uh, but at the same time, uh, they depend on natural gas from Russia. And the pipeline that goes to Poland goes through Belarus. So they have some influence over the movement of natural gas to the rest of Europe, although they're not likely to um, uh, challenge Russia on that because of the Russian provision of foreign aid. The next player is Ukraine. This is typically played by two players, one who does military operations and the other one who does diplomacy. It's not particularly onerous because the, the Ukrainians have 10 divisions and typically they start the game by being deployed in 10 cities. And they basically resist in those cities until they're destroyed or they can retreat. Uh, in the game mechanic, uh, once you've taken the difference in the strength of the units, that gives you the 10% chance of a unit retreating. A unit, however, that cannot retreat, meaning it cannot go backward without going adjacent to uh, an enemy unit, is destroyed. So you can see here various points uh, for the Ukrainians, primarily uh, getting into NATO, getting to the European Union, receiving foreign aid, um, and if there's any dramatic changes within Russia itself. Um, obviously, uh, Ukraine would prefer not to be a nuclear battlefield. There's large numbers of negatives, but primarily focused on loss of cities, lots of different parts of the territory. Uh, if they have to get rid of the Azov Brigade under uh, Western pressure, the loss of natural gas, nuclear detonations on their territory, and rocket attacks on their cities. Now, NATO and, and Europe, uh, your EU policy consensus means that um, it's important that there's unanimous agreement on, among the members of those different organizations in order to make an action like intervention in Ukraine or to accept a uh, country uh, like uh, Ukraine into NATO or into the European uh, Union. Uh, and this uh, applies um, both to uh, Ukraine and to Finland in their bids uh, to join uh, NATO. The second, uh, uh, the next card rather, is the Baltic states, which are Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, Finland, and Sweden. Um, their primary concern is to make sure that NATO deploys forces within their territory to offset the deployment of Russian forces. Again, Russia's got 12 divisions. Some of those can be deployed opposite the Baltic to draw off of some of um, NATO's forces, specifically the Americans. But the Americans, the English, the French, the Italians, the Germans, the Poles, and the Romanians, when they deploy forces, it, it costs negative victory points. It's expensive to deploy forces. So there is a consequence to deploying uh, military um, uh, forces. Uh, but uh, aside from the receipt of natural gas, you'll see a lot of these points are similar to other countries. You'll see the policy instruments. Uh, the Baltic states have some foreign aid that they can dispense. There's uh, the ability to sanction Russia to some level. They can also target specific Siloviki factions, including money laundering, because some of the factions, uh, the Siloviki oligarchs, find um, uh, sanctuary uh, for their money in the Baltic states. And the Baltic states can also uh, trigger, uh, once per game, uh, Russian and Belarus dissidents by providing sanctuary. And so this is the initial impetus that starts the increase uh, in the discontent levels within Belarus and Russia that tempts the Russian military to help the police in suppressing dissent, which then opens up Amnesty International's actions. So here you can see the basic uh, rule, which uh, basically is the calculation for how many NATO forces must deploy to offset how many Russian forces. The next player is Eastern Europe. These are the frontline states of Poland and Romania. They're primarily concerned with not allowing Western Ukraine to fall, not allowing Odessa um, uh, to fall to the Russians in the case of Romania, uh, keeping the, the Turks um, uh, so that they're not closing the um, access to the Black Sea for NATO and for commerce uh, through uh, Romania. So essentially they're, they're 
uh, highly incentivized to get NATO to forward deploy their military forces into Poland and Romania to protect them um, uh, once the Russians get up to the border. Uh, this, this player also represents Slovakia. These are some of the policy instruments uh, for the uh, East Europe player, Poland, Romania, and Slovakia. You've got economic sanctions and again the ability to provide sanctuary to dissidents in Russia and Belarus. The next player is Orthodox NATO, which includes Greece, Bulgaria, and non-Orthodox Hungary. These countries are uh, different from Eastern European countries because their primary focus is either against Turkey rather than against Russia. In fact, they rely on Russia to counterbalance Turkey, or like uh, Viktor Orban in Hungary, they depend on the importation of Russian gas, and they're sympathetic to the social values that are conservative that are pushed by Vladimir Putin. So these particular players uh, act as spoilers. Um, they're not likely to accept Ukraine as a NATO member. Um, they, they don't receive um, overwhelming uh, victory points for the defeat of Vladimir Putin, and it's in fact in their interest for Vladimir Putin not to get overthrown. So you can see the slightly different um, points. Uh, they're not friendly uh, to Turkey. Uh, they don't want Turkey to, sh to close the straits uh, either. And they're also susceptible to pressure um, by Amnesty International. You'll see here some of their policy instruments. They could certainly host um, uh, and provide sanctuary for Russian and Belarus dissidents. They can also act to reduce the power of Amnesty International operating against Russia or Belarus by half, although at some public relations cost. Uh, but it's far more likely they're going to be t the target of sanctions or the absence of foreign aid uh, from the more powerful NATO members if they do that. And you can see they can also sanction uh, other countries. Germany and Italy are another player. Um, the salient point here uh, is first, Germany and Italy are very dependent on natural gas. So they import 40 points uh, from Russia. So they're the largest customer. They would suffer very large negatives if that gas were to be cut off. So they're also spoilers. They're not particularly eager to confront Russia to the extent that it would lead Russia to cut off gas to these countries. You can also see the chart of the victory point costs for the different levels of military assistance and NATO military intervention. Right, And recall that there are some circumstances where uh, these costs are increased by one victory point if Russia fires rockets into uh, Eastern Europe to destroy the logistics centers. These are the policy instruments. Uh, the Germans and the Italians have significant amounts of foreign aid. They can sanction a lot of different countries, including uh, fellow NATO members that are not uh, compliant, like the Orthodox NATO. They can target specific Siloviki uh, factions, uh, although only um, uh, once per turn, and be, they, they have a double effect against those that chose money laundering because uh, it means that their money uh, their monies are exposed in German banks. You can also see, um, and this is a maximum once per turn, but uh, essentially an unlimited number of times, that Germans and Italians may engage in information cyber war to stoke discontent in Russia, although at one victory point cost, it's fairly expensive. The next player is the UK and France. Uh, they're more detached. Uh, they're also one of the three parties that can fund um, assistance to uh, Ukraine. Uh, they do depend, uh, but to a much lesser extent, on natural gas uh, from Russia. Uh, they're generally, because they're displaced from the uh, immediately ba immediate battlefield, uh, they, they are incentivized to see regime change in Russia. So the French and the English uh, have that incentive. But on the other hand, there's also a very strong incentive to arrange a ceasefire in, in the form of the um, French leader, Macron. Here you can see, uh, again, a very long list of policy instruments, including sanctions, foreign aid, um, uh, uh, targeting the uh, discontent index through cyber war as well, and the ability to specifically target Siloviki factions. And this particular faction, however, because of the impact of oligarch money on London and the, the, the financiers there, uh, there's a particular uh, 
a, a negative victory point effect if the British um, engage in sanctioning the Siloviki. So they don't want to. They don't want to target oligarchs. They're disincentivized in this game. The next player is U.S. and Canada. Their primary focus is to uh, pull the Germans off of their dependence on Russian natural gas. But they do provide a uh, less than optimal alternative. So uh, Germany would suffer. Uh, and Russia and America has to pay for this um, diversion of uh, energy resources. But besides that, um, America's main concern is dealing with the BRIC threat, specifically in the form of China's threat to Taiwan. Uh, so the Americans do have three divisions, but they normally keep them in reserve to deploy them to Asia in the event the Russians get the Chinese to put pressure on uh, Taiwan or Iran. So the Americans are playing the global version of this game. They're not really incentivized to deploy to, to Europe, although they do, they do have substantial economic resources. So these are the policy instruments. The Americans have an overwhelming amount of foreign aid. Uh, they can target the Siloviki factions, including money laundering. They've got cyber warfare capabilities, and they can sanction a lot of different countries. The next player are the BRICS. These are the rest of the world trading community who uh, have, on one level, they have the ability to absorb any natural gas the Russians are not able to sell. They are incentivized to encourage peace to occur. Um, but uh, they're not particularly incentivized to cooperate with Western sanctions against Russia. And they have the ability, uh, through punishment instruments, to make life very difficult uh, for uh, the U.S. Canadian player, uh, particularly by stoking uh, Iran, Pakistan, or issues over uh, Taiwan. They can provide military assistance to uh, Russia as well. Uh, but on the other hand, they can also engage in um, targeting Kazakh discontent. The U.S. can always give the BRIC an enormous foreign aid uh, package in the form of, you know, essentially representing a greater trade access. And then they could convince the BRICs to act um, in cooperation with the Western world against uh, Russian depredations in the Ukraine. The next player is Turkey. This is a NATO member. Turkey has an incentive to play both sides. It's not particularly friendly with the European Union, and its relations with NATO largely reflect that. It has an incentive to back Azerbaijan against Russian-backed Armenia and to exploit uh, Russian problems in Ukraine to get greater influence over uh, Russia's ally Syria. Uh, they are incentivized uh, in the victory points to negotiate a peaceful conclusion to the conflict, and they have the threat of closing the uh, Straits of Marmara that allows uh, access between the Mediterranean and the Black Sea. And they can also target Siloviki factions. This is uh, the headquarters of Amnesty International, uh, the original headquarters uh, in Ottawa, Canada. So Amnesty International is a very important player. They get victory points equal to the discontent level of Belarus, Russia, and Kazakhstan. And they get other points if they're able to install a dissident, which is a fallen Siloviki faction, into power. They also get points for getting the uh, Poles, as a part of Eastern Europe, and the Hungarians as a part of Orthodox NATO, to liberalize their social uh, policies. They pay a minus one victory point penalty for each agitation attempt in Russia, Belarus, or Kazakhstan, but they can only do it after a Russian military policing event. So we essentially expect there to be an increase in the level of discontent. And it gets to some point where it's damaging the Siloviki. The Siloviki are going to cooperate, the military is going to do a quick suppression operation, and then Amnesty International is going to go into business, and you're going to see a very rapid rise. So in this game, it uh, to hold Amnesty International at bay, the Russian military has to convince the Siloviki simply to absorb the hits from uh, discontent and to, to uh, suffer a reduction of their influence. So the conclusion of the game is to determine a victor. And the way that victory is determined um, is not by the absolute value of the negative points, but uh, 
by taking the sum of the points and using it to calculate a standard deviation, which then is used to calculate a z-score, which you can see here. And the z-score then tells us how much better or worse a particular player did compared to all previous plays of this particular game. And as we've only played it once, we have only a single n of one, and we're not able to make a specific determination of victory yet.